Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. We will be starting the webinar shortly, uh, promptly at 1 p.m. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for our 2016 index launch of the Opportunity Index. I'm your host, Selena Gonzalez-Jones, and I'm the Director of Impact and Community Engagement at Opportunity Nation. I will operate today's, I will moderate today's conversation. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Today's first, um, I, uh, first we will hear today from um, from myself, who will be talking, um, moderating the call. Um, our Opportunity Nation Executive Director, Monique Reiser. Uh, I will then talk about our Opportunity Index findings. Uh, then we will hear um, about the data and methodology for the index from Rebecca Gluskin of. Measure of America, our data research partner. Then we will move to our index in action by LaShawn Amato of YouthBill. Following all of our agenda points today, we will go over questions and answers. If you have any questions that you would like to ask, we encourage you to type them into uh, the GoToWebinar question section, um, and we will address those at the end during our Q&A period. Um, and that will be read off by our communications director, Stacey Hyde. Also, we encourage you all to tweet throughout the event. If you find something interesting or a fact that you would like to share with social media, uh, please feel free to tweet using the hashtag opindex. Uh, now I will turn over to, things over to Monique Reiser, the executive director of Opportunity Nation. Thank you, Selena, and thank you everybody for joining us today. We have a sellout crowd on the call. 
Um, just uh, really great participation um, today. So we're excited and uh, bear with us as we uh, deal with some technical difficulties, but we're going to keep moving because we have a lot to cover today. Um, so I will be brief. Um, the, it, the Opportunity Index, which Selena and Rebecca will go into more deeply, um, has been an incredible creation of the past six years. Um, Measure of America and Opportunity Nation has worked closely together to develop the concept of the index as something that can be used to look at a multiple, multiple dimension, multi-dimensional way to look at opportunity. Um, and we've been able to uh, frame opportunity in this way along these 16 indicators and economic, civic, and education dimensions. But also it's been a great frame to look at other industries and areas of work. So for example, we looked at the retail industry through the lens of the Opportunity Index, again, working with Measure of America, um, released that port in, report in September. We've also looked at civic engagement through the lens of the Opportunity Index. And both of those are, are just illuminate some of the conversations that we have when we're talking about opportunity. Um, this year's index I found fascinating because uh, it, it's data, but it really told a very human story. Um, it, t it told the story of what Americans, I think, are feeling and experiencing and what we saw in the election, which is some people are doing well um, and better in today's economy. The index shows upward progress in jobs, wages, um, some areas of education, but we're but the scores stay the same this year, um, and partly due to this area of civic engagement and people volunteering and joining groups and access to community resources like doctors and grocery stores. So uh, I found that to be an interesting theme for this year's index. Um, and on that note of coming together and connectedness, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, we're, we work in a, with a coalition of 350 organizations to do this work. Um, collaboration and bipartisanship really is essential to address some of the challenges that we see reflected in the index and to close the opportunity gap. So uh, I hope you'll stick with us after the index. Um, on the 15th, we are co-hosting the Opportunity America Summit. Uh, this Way Up with Opportunity America, some friends of ours, um, where the Speaker of the House and some other notable speakers will be talking about this issue and areas of intervention sort of beyond federal investment. Um, we also, in 2017, will be embarking on a series of conversations about restoring the American dream that align with the six Opportunity Millennium Goals that we released in our, our Opportunity Nation Plan at the September Opportunity Summit. So you'll be hearing about those um, in the coming days and weeks ahead. I also just want to thank the Opportunity Nation team, Stacey Height, Kimberly, Erica, uh, Selena, and all the rest of the Opportunity Nation team who's worked really hard on this for the past few months. I also want to thank Rebecca and the team at Measure of America. You all have been fabulous partners in this journey over the past six years. And, um, and some friends of ours at MasterCard Center for Inclusive Economics, they also helped um, review some of the data. So it really is a collaborative effort to make this come to life every year. And we thank all of you for participating and learning and sharing your stories. And with that, I will hand it back to Selena. Thank you, Monique. Uh, now that you all know a little bit about Opportunity Nation as a whole, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the work that we do and specifically talk with you all about the Opportunity Index. Opportunity Nation is a bipartisan national campaign comprised of over 350 organizations who all work together to expand economic mobility and close the opportunity gap that exists here in America. And we really do that in three different ways. One way is convening cross-sector groups, um, and that is done through our coalition work. Another way is ad advancing bipartisan legislation that is done through work our coalition as well as our opportunity leaders. And the last way we uh, do our approach is by measuring access to opportunity, and that's done through our annual opportunity index. The index is an annual composite measure of state and county level scores looking at three different dimensions that fall within economic, educational, and civic engagement factors um, and how they expand or constrict opportunity across the U.S. The Opportunity Index is a tool that was developed in 2011 and it was developed in partnership with our data partner, Measure of America. Next slide. The Opportunity Index 
allows us to look more closely about access to opportunity across the U.S. and how those things differ depending upon where you live. One way that we highlight and showcase this is our story of John and Jane. Uh, one of them lives in Nassau County, New York, and the other lives in Tarrant County, Texas. These are counties both very similar size and unemployment rates, and one would assume that based on these factors that they would have equal access to opportunity. But this isn't the case, and our Opportunity Index tool really allows its users to have a deeper look at the stark differences in communities based on zip code. If you will look at the comparison of John and Jane, the poverty rate and youth not working is higher in Tarrant County, and the median income is higher in Nassau County. It's also important to put these in context for the overall country as a whole. Next slide. And despite those similar factors, you can see that living in Nassau County elicits John a score of a opportunity grade of an A minus, while Jane has a score of a C. Next slide. You can also see more of wage information, poverty information, access to secondary uh, education, and disconnected youth in comparison to both counties as well as the nation's average. Next slide. Looking at this data is something that we really believe highlights the issue of zip code really determining what access to opportunities one has and that that should not be the case here in the United States. Next slide. As mentioned earlier, the Opportunity Index is made up of three different dimensions that fall in economic, educational, and community factors. Those three dimensions are made up of a total of 16 different indicators that we believe through social science research um, done in partnership with Measure of America and a listening tour conducted with our coalition members. Um, both parties felt like these were the things that most identified what access to opportunity is determined by. Next slide. Now I will turn things over to Rebecca Gluskin of Measure of America to discuss a little bit more about the methodology of the Opportunity Index. Thanks, Lena. Can everyone hear me? Okay, okay great. Um, okay, so my name is Rebecca Gluskin. I am the Chief Statistician at Measure of America. Um, we are a project of the Social Science Research Council and uh, look to breathe numbers into life. So we've been working with Opportunity Nation for six years, um, calculating, collecting data, and running the Opportunity Index. And I'm going to go over the methodology. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the Opportunity Index focuses on the conditions present in different communities, specifically um, the state, national, and county level. And these factors are particularly useful because they are amenable to policy change and community action. So in doing the research to understand which indicators would best um, fit into our index, we really wanted to find um, factors that community members and legislators could work to make improvements on. So this index was jointly developed to measure American Opportunity Nation um, back in 2010. Next slide, please. So we mentioned that there are three dimensions, uh, economics, education, and community and civic engagement. And all dimensions are weighted equally. <clears throat> um, so there are a bunch of different indicators that fall under each dimension, but that these three are then weighted with equal weight so that the index has a balanced value. Next slide, please. So we take measurements at the county level and at the state level. At the state level, there are 16 indicators that Selena pointed out on the previous slide. Um, and these indicators are, um, are calculated and, and, and ranked on a score of 100 to 1. Um, and we quantify this, um, these grades at these all 50 states in the District of Columbia and also at the national level. <coughs> At the county level, um, there are only 14 indicators, and that is because um, at the county level, 
national data sets don't measure volunteerism and um, community engagement. And so we then, for the counties, we have a grading system on a scale of A to F. Um, so this is because um, counties have high variability in data, and so we group them into these categories so that you can get a ballpark range for the counties. Um, and there are over 2,700 counties available to view. Next slide, please. I think this is Selena. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, since 2011, Opportunity Nation has been working with Measure of America to measure access to opportunity across the nation at the state and county levels. Next slide. Each year, we rank those states um, based on their opportunity score and opportunity grades. We often look at each uh, state from one, from 1 to 51, but then um, identify our top five states and our, top, um, and our bottom five states. Um, the top five states are normally in our northeast region, and our bottom states have often been in the south, where we also often see the most improvement. Next slide. Overall, uh, in addition to each state receiving an Opportunity Index score, we give a score to the nation as a whole. And overall, Opportunity in America has increased 8.9% since our 2011 index. The surprising thing that we found this year was although there has been a steady growth in the Opportunity Index, since the 2011 index in the national score, uh, last year's index was, in comparison to this year's index, is the first year that we've seen scores stagnate, meaning that the opportunity index score for the nation was the same in 2016 as it was in our 2015 index. Next slide. Although we have seen stagnation in the nation's overall score, we have seen some positive trends in different communities and states throughout the U.S. One of those positive trends is unemployment rate falling 45% and violent crime rates decreasing by 15.4% since our 2011 index. Next slide. We have seen median income decrease since our 2011 index but on a positive note, have seen increases in median income since our 2015 index. Next slide. Despite positive trends in unemployment and median income, we have continued to see an increase across the nation in inequality in communities throughout the U.S. Uh, that has increased 4.1% since our 2011 index. Next slide. In relation to poverty, we have seen an increase since our 2011 index at 8.3%. And since, but on a positive note, since our 2015 index, we have seen a decrease in poverty at 1.9%. Next slide. And I'll turn this over to Rebecca to talk a little bit more about the correlation between three important factors, poverty, youth connection, and post-secondary completion. Thanks, Selena. Um, so every year we do a, a, a Pearson correlation to just look and see which um, variables have the strongest association with the Opportunity Index. Um, and uh, this year in 2016 hasn't been that different from previous years, but um, poverty. Uh, is a strong has a strong influence on the index youth disconnection, which is the number of youth age 16 to 24 who are not working and not in school, um, also ha is a strong co correlation. And then finally, post-secondary completion um, <clears throat> in the education dimension also seems to correlate um, highly with higher opportunity scores um, at both the county level and the county level as well. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Rebecca. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. And so um, 
one of the things that Rebecca talked about was youth disconnection. And on a positive note, one thing that we have seen overall throughout the nation is that youth disconnection has fallen each year and has fallen 9.1% since our 2011 index. Um, this is a great thing. This is super positive. Um, but one thing is that although we have seen these, uh, next slide, although we have seen disconnected youth go down, uh, it still remains above 2007 pre-recession levels. There are a total of over, well, there are over 5 million disconnected youth in the U.S. according to our 2016 index. Next slide. This represents 13.2% of youth in the U.S. that are disconnected from work and school. Next slide. Overall, something that we have consistently seen year after year is that when communities do well, our, when youth do well, our communities do well. And this is highlighted by some of the um, discussion that Rebecca had in relation to uh, state opportunity index scores, youth disconnection, poverty, and post-secondary completion. Something that we would also like to highlight is that we discussed inequality um, and that it's something that has continued to increase since our 2011 index. Um, and our 2016 index this year found that inequality increased in 45 states throughout the nation. So definitely some compelling info. Next slide. Now I will turn things over to Rebecca from Measure of America to talk a little bit more about the data and calculation of the slide, of, of our data. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so a little more detail about how the index is calculated. Um, even prior to step one, we spend um, several months collecting data from various resources, um, from the American Community Survey, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, from the Department of Education. So. <clears throat> a lot of work goes into collecting the data. And when we have the data, we rescale the indicators so that they are all on a common scale because data can be in a percent or dollar value or count. Um, next step is that we take the average rescaled scores together within the three dimensions. So as we mentioned before, each dimension is one third of the index. So some dimensions have more variables than others, um, and each one is averaged across their dimensions. Finally, we calculate the index score um, for each state, and then also uh, we calculate the grade for each county. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, data sources are widely varied, um, percents, ratios, um, all over the place. <laughs> and so in order to combine them into a composite index, uh, we have to convert them into a common scale. Um, so there's various ways to do this. What we do is we transform it to a scale from 0 to 100 um, by comparing performance of a state or county to a given indicator um, and scaling it to the best and worst performance anywhere within that indicator. So for example, um, here's an on-time freshman graduation in Massachusetts number. So um, in Massachusetts, it was 82.6%. And you subtract the worst um, performing uh, in the country, which is uh, 55, and then 100 is the best, which um, is actually a cap. No one has 100. Um, then multiply that 100 to get the rescaled value. OK, next slide, please. Once all the indicators are rescaled, we average the rescaled values um, for all the indicators in the dimension. So uh, for the education example, there's I believe there are four indicators in there, and we take um, for a state the average as rescaled um, with preschool enrollment, on time high school graduation, and post secondary completion. So we take those, I apologize, it's three values, three values, um, and then divide by three to get the average. Next slide, please. Each of the three dimensions makes up one third of the final index value. So the final score is the average of these three dimensions um, in states and for counties. The opportunity grades range from A plus to F. In order to, or this is done because we need to reflect the extremes, um, extreme values that are seen in counties. 
So these grades are determined based on how far a county's final score is from the average. In cut points, your grades are based on numbers, um, number of standard deviation above or below the mean. So counties are given a letter grade based on the normal distribution within um, this 2016 index. Um, so then, let's see, the final score, oh, yeah, next slide actually, we'll move on. Those are the three averages. Next slide, please. Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, I will now turn things over to LaShawn Amado of Opportunity Youth United and Youth Build. LaShawn will talk a little bit about the index in action and what that is, is tangible ways that um, people in the community are using the index in their day-to-day -day work. So LaShawn, take it away. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, can, can you guys hear me? Yes, they're all on mute, LaShawn. You can go ahead. Oh, ah, exactly. Um, so, uh, good afternoon. Again, my name is LaShawn Amato. I serve as the National Coordinator of Community Action Teams for Opportunity Youth United, which is housed at Youth for USA. Um, and again, I'm here to talk about how we've been using the um, Opportunity Index to drive local change in communities across the nation. Uh, could you change this slide? So, uh, just to sort of set the context, I want to talk to you uh, about what Opportunity Youth United is and sort of how we've, the journey to land where we are now with this movement. Uh, so moving over. So Opportunity Youth United started with the National Council of Young Leaders. Uh, the National Council of Young Leaders was a diverse group of 20 young leaders uh, who were nominated by 15, we're now at 16 national youth serving organizations and all of these young leaders are former opportunity youth who have sort of overcame the obstacles, been through these programs uh, and can have the credibility to, to build the framework and inform what the plan should be to reconnect uh, the 5.3 million opportunity youth it looks like um, in the data. Uh, next slide please. So this council got together and, you know, they identified the issues, but they did something a little different. Uh, they came up with some solutions. Uh, so we came up with a set of policy recommendations that we call increase in opportunity and decrease in poverty in America. Now this document has two main components. In the front end, we have six immediate priorities to reconnect one million youth. And that includes expanding comprehensive programming, including programs like Youth Build and the Core Network and other programs where young people get a lot of services in one place, so education, job training, career, um, case management, uh, the whole full scheme of the whole big picture. Secondly, expanding national service, uh, expanding private internships, mentoring, uh, pathways to higher education, and lastly, supporting diversion and reentry programs. So again, those are immediate priorities for immediate action. Now, to really change systems, we also have some recommendations um, for broader system change in five key areas, and they are criminal justice, upward mobility, education, family engagement, and community development. Next slide, please. Uh, it's also important to mention that this movement is guided by some principles for action, which include love, responsibility, inclusion, accountability, and collaboration, and many others. Next slide, please. Uh, but, you know, the council, with our, with our platform, we begin to have, you know, meet with a lot of high-level officials on the Hill, in the White House, uh, eventually the recommendations um, landed in Hillary Clinton's hand, uh, but the council members felt the need to get on the ground and really work with communities and build power on the ground. 
Um, so that is what morphed us from the National Council of Young Leaders, which still exists, um, into OYU. Now, Opportunity Youth United is a national movement of Opportunity Youth and their adult allies to increase opportunity and decrease poverty in America, as I mentioned. And although it's sort of national, it's grassroots, um, it's a grassroots uh, membership movement to mobilize opportunity youth to become civically engaged and stand at the forefront of real change in the community and create more pathways to reconnection. One of our primary goals is to really uplift the voices of opportunity youth in political conversation at all levels, but we really stress the importance of local and state engagement. Um, in addition to informing policy, we also want to have opportunity youth serve as advisors to all sectors, including corporations, philanthropy, community-based programs, um, and also city initiatives that are emerging across the nation. Next slide. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have 16 national uh, sponsoring organizations. Here's a picture of many of our partners, not all of them. So we have Youth Build, Europe, Aspen Institute, Gateway to College, Public Allies, Be the Change, and then a number of others. Next slide. Here's just an image of some of our partners, Opportunity Youth Network, Spark Action. I'm sorry, Opportunity Nation should be on here. I should have updated that, but Opportunity Nation is definitely one of our big partners. Next slide. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how that looks on the ground. So we talk about building power on the ground, uh, building power in young people, and let's talk about how we make that happen. So we're doing that. What we did was we identified 10 cities that we were going to work with to build community action teams. Now, these community action teams um, do four essential um, duties. The first thing is to convene all, all the organizations in that city who are serving this population to create that agenda for opportunity youth. How many opportunity youth are in this city? Um, how many slots do we have available, available for them? What are the gaps? How do we fill them? Secondly, I mentioned building a spirit of civic engagement, so we try to get the young people in the community, registering the um, community to vote, having them show up to hearings and testifying, um, things like that, which feeds into the third point um, of having young people not only show up, but having them stand up and speak up, uh, because when you just put a whole bunch of young people in the room, that does have impact. When you have young people trained to speak up on the issues, um, it moves if it builds relationships and it moves policy. Um, and lastly, we want young people, again, informing programs, initiatives, so on and so forth. Next slide. Um, here's a picture of the structure of the community action team, like organization in the community who has an organizer who's pulling the community together, a coordinating council of young leaders who's really leading the charge and community partners who are supporting them, all in the name of support and opportunity youth. Um, next slide. Um, so we are partnering uh, with Opportunity Nation on their millennial goal to reconnect uh, one million uh, disconnected youth, they say, but we use the term opportunity youth. Uh, next slide. Uh, and I'd like to talk about what we've done on the national level. So on the national level, we have this document called the Bridge to Reconnection, which analyzed the number of opportunity youth in America and the amount of federally uh, invested um, slots available for those young people. Uh, so we've done that analysis. We know what the gaps are. We know what it costs. We know what it takes um, to connect these young people. But the challenge is, how do we do that same analysis on a local level? And that's what we've been really looking to Opportunity Nation to help us do. Next slide. So I didn't have the fancy pictures and things like how Selena and uh, everyone else had. But here's um, the index for two communities that we're organizing in, Boston and Sacramento. And I'll just sort of speak to some of the numbers here. So in Boston, uh, they have, let's see, violence in the community, three times the national average. Um, they also, um, 
working on getting some the education rate. They have a high inequality in Sacramento. Uh, same thing, education. They're working on well. They're doing pretty good in education. The the, the violence in the communities um, above national averages in their county. Um, disconnection rates higher than the national average in their county. Um, so that's the context that we're using for our action. Next slide. So let's talk about how they're responding to those challenges. So in Boston, like I said, they're dealing with violence, inequality. So Boston started had a state house rally, brought together 300 young people um, from 15 different organizations, had a program with elected officials, young people talking about the challenges in Boston. That led to Stuck on Replay, which is a series of community uh, forums where the community has been de developing recommendations to advise the Council of State Government on how to reduce uh, mass incarceration in Boston. And lastly, to address inequality and race um, um, issues, they, the leader or organization in Boston participated in a race dialogue with the mayor of Boston um, and community members. Next slide. I know we're getting close. Uh, Sacramento, they're working on the Department of Youth and Service Fund. Um, and uh, working with City Council on the Department of Youth. I'm speeding up here. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, and that's it. Um, you know, we, we, we hope to continue to emerge in cities across the nation uh, because as the data shows, when opportunity you succeed, we all succeed and those numbers boost across the board. Um, and that's all I have. Sorry, I went over 34 seconds. Not a problem, LaShawn. Thank you so much for sharing with us information on your organization and also how you all are using the index in your work to really empower young people. We really appreciate your, your words. Uh, now we will move on to our Q&A period. Um, as mentioned earlier, we ask that you would type in your questions um, in the upper, upper right-hand box. Can someone please mute their phone? Thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, as mentioned earlier, we ask that you type in your questions in the upper right-hand box. Um, those questions will be sent to our Director of Communications, Stacy Height, who will read those, uh, those questions aloud, and, uh, and we will go from there. And also, uh, one more reminder that uh, please feel free to tweet throughout this conversation uh, using the hashtag OpIndex. Okay, the first question is, why do we think the opportunity score didn't increase since 2015? And that's for Rebecca or Selena. Uh, Rebecca, I'll allow you to go first, and then we can talk a little bit more about it as well. Okay. Um, so, I mean, this is a national uh, trend we saw, <clears throat> was that between 2015 and 2016, there was no significant change. Um, and if you dig into the index, there were gains in education and, and the economy scores. Um, and, and what we saw overall is that in the community engagement, there were some declines. So on balance, um, across the board, things sort of averaged out. Um, each state was different. Each county is different. So um, it's hard to say exactly. You know, it's you can't pinpoint one specific thing because the index is fairly complicated, but overall there were gains in the economy, gains in um, education, but some decreases in the community dimension. Thanks, Rebecca. Now for our next question. Does your team believe that the opportunity index favors opportunity in large regions? For instance, there may be more disconnected youth in large regions, but there may be more in agencies conducting outreach to them. Do you find that the highest opportunity areas are also the most populated areas? So um, this is Selena from Opportunity Nation. Um, I'll let Rebecca talk a little bit um, more about the integrity of the data, um, but something I think that we, that we see and a point that I think that our index shows is that uh, where you live uh, does determine a lot of access to 
um, a lot of different things that impact opportunity. And um, I think that when you see access to, to certain resources in certain communities, that that's often based on where those communities are located, whether they be in the South or the no Northeast region or other regions throughout the U.S. Um, and that's one of our main points of the index is that uh, where people live is too much of a determining factor of what resources they have access to. And often we do see that um, residents in Northeast regions of the U.S. have access to um, larger uh, resources and other um, opportunities. Um, so um, I think that's something that we, we've seen throughout the index. Um, I'll let Rebecca speak a little bit more specifically about how that's assessed and um, contextualized within the data. Thanks, Lena. Um, so I don't think we can say uh, broadly what that disconnect more. There's more disconnected youth in smaller regions, smaller cities, and, and fewer disconnected youth in larger cities um, because it's a ratio, right? So there's, you know, in New York City, there's um, <clears throat> there's thousands of disconnected youth, but in smaller regions, you'll have sometimes a few hundred. But the proportion compared to how many youth are in this in that region is really the important factor. Um, so yeah, I think overall you can't really say it's based on the metropolitan area size or the county size, but it, it is really um, based on, on multiple factors, education, economics, and also the community that we are researching. Thank you, Rebecca. We'll move on to our next question. What does the ratio mean in income inequality? I'll let Rebecca talk a little bit more about how that's calculated. Sure, and let me see. Is there, I wonder if, are there extra slides or am I, am I, those were not included. Those are not included. Um, so just broadly speaking, the income ratio is the ratio um, of those making a certain percentage below the poverty line um, over the ratio the, of those making um, over the over 80 percent of the poverty line. So um, we, this is a calculation that that gives you a score from one to five. And so um, <clears throat> what we're calculating is the number of people who are making in the top 80 percent versus the number of people um, in the lower 20 percent. So um, this is a, a custom calculation. It's it's something that we find is very useful. Um, and I can give you more information. I, I could send around the slide that details it a little better because I, I do like to write these things out. Um, so feel feel free to email me and I can send that slide to you. Thanks, Rebecca. Our next question. Do you have a point of view on the 9.1% decrease since 2011? Are you pleased with that decrease or do you think it should be higher? This is Monique. Um, I'll go ahead and answer that question. Um, and Selena and uh, Rebecca are welcome to chime in. I mean, I think overall, of, of course, you know, we're happy to see uh, some really important economic indicators going up. Um, jobs, wages, um, poverty rates, those have all improved. And if you've seen recent census data, you've, it's even more um, since, since we've looked at the index data. I think really what I was surprised about, and as Rebecca discussed, that um, what may have been holding back the score from increasing even more was the civic dimension, um, particularly on group membership and volunteerism. We've, you know, the Measure of America team uh, created these indicators with us based off of actual research, and the idea of uh, social connection and social trust is really important when we're talking about opportunity. So it may not have been a significant factor in holding the score down, but I think it's enough that's worth the conversation that we need to see opportunity increase along all of these dimensions. So we're, we're doing well on um, preschool in some areas. Uh, we're doing well certainly on high school graduation and increasing um, post-secondary credentials. But perhaps a lesson for all of us over the past year and from the index is that um, we need to be better connected as a community. We know that's important um, from research that we did with Measure America on civic engagement and opportunities, that if they're volunteering, their rates of disconnection drop in half. So um, we're pleased with pro progress. Of course, we'd like it to be higher, and we'd like to see um, all those rising, if you will, along each of the three dimensions. 
Chris, uh, Rebecca, would you add anything to that? Um, yeah, just to say that, um, yeah, there there are some major gains um, across the nation in a certain, you know, in undisconnected youth overall. Um, but uh, Measure of America does put out a report each year on disconnected youth that then looks at um, the disparities between race, racial, ethnic, and, and gender groups. And so um, what we have seen over the past three to four years that we've been writing these reports is that gains are made in certain groups and not others. Um, so sometimes it's not a geographic question, but it can be racial, ethnic, gender issues as well. Thank you, Rebecca. Stacy, for our next question. What are the 10 Opportunity Youth Cities? That's for LaShawn. OK, I'm here. Um, so right now, our, our initial target was Boston, Los Angeles, Sacramento, Philadelphia, New Orleans, Phoenix, Detroit, Atlanta, uh, New York, and uh, I think I'm blanking on one, uh, but that's quite a list already. Um, and I'd be happy to share those cities with anyone um, as a follow-up. And also a list of cities, what we found is that a lot of cities um, who weren't on our list have approached us and said, hey, we really want to do this. So we're talking to communities um, who have emerged. Uh, and then we also have our eye on a few strategic cities that we want to work with for um, 2017 as well. So we got a number of cities that we're looking at. And I'll, again, I'll be happy to share that. Thanks, LaShawn. Uh, Stacy will read our next question. What is your five-year and or 10-year plan? As an organization, what particularly are you wanting to accomplish? And in the five-year plan, was it modified based on the election results? That's a great question. This is Monique. I think I should take that one. Um, so I would refer to this plan we put together with our coalition in September at the summit called Our Opportunity Nation. We worked with uh, a former chief domestic policy advisor for uh, President Clinton and a former chief domestic policy advisor for President Bush looked at the evidence, looked at what's happening across the country when it comes to this issue of opportunity, and we came up with these six Opportunity Millennium Goals. So that really is going to be our North Star moving forward at Opportunity Nation, as well as taking into consideration what's happening around in the country. So I'll address that question about the election. But the six Opportunity Millennium Goals, I hope you'll check them out on our website, OpportunityNation.org, um, our Opportunity Nation. They are um, No Child Hungry or Homeless by 2025 achieving a 90% high, a high school graduation rate by 2020 and turning around all low-performing schools by 2025. Also by 2025, doubling the number of post-secondary degrees, certificates, and industry credentials, reducing the unemployment rate to 5% for all. As you know, the, the national unemployment rate is 5%. Opportunity for young people, it's still nearly double that. Um, and to cut the child poverty rate in half within a decade. Our fifth goal is to re-engage a million opportunity youth each year by 2025. And our sixth goal is to engage a million Americans in national service within a decade. So we obviously can't accomplish these in a year, um, but they are goals that we hope will galvanize the country around long-term um, growth when we're talking about opportunity and closing the gap. The question about the election, um, you know, Opportunity Nation is a bipartisan campaign. We've been very proud to work with uh, multiple sectors and multiple points of view um, around issues where there is common ground. So in some respects, the election did not change our, our plans because these are our goals. And we know that Republicans, Democrats, left, right, and center um, share, uh, share these goals with us um, based off many conversations. You know, we're co-hosting this Opportunity America Summit this week where the Speaker of the House will be talking about his, his plan for America. We've also engaged um, Senator Booker on, on the left and Senator Scott on the right who spoke at our summit because our goal and our mission is to build a big tent where there is common ground. Um, so we're excited and, and I think like many of you out there looking for opportunities to uh, insert ourselves into this new conversation with a new national, leader, new national leadership. But I would also add that 
um, change is happening at the local level. So a national election is really important and we want to make sure we can inf influence systemic change, but local communities like LaShawn and the communities that he's working in with his group are, are making change as well. So um, we encourage folks to look at both what's happening on the national level and what they can do in their own communities with their superintendents, with their mayors, with their governors, and with the data, hopefully with the Opportunity Index, to know where they are and where they can go as a community. Thanks, Monique. Our next question. This also may be the last question, so if you have any questions, please type them in and we'll get them answered for you. Um, is there a way to pull data by zip code in particular counties to highlight concentrations of opportunity use? I'll take that one. Uh, absolutely. You can go to our website, uh, www.opportunityindex.org. Um, once you go onto the website, you're able to type in your zip code and it will pull your opportunity score for your state as well as your opportunity grade for your county. Um, and once that information is pulled, it will list your scoring for each of the 16 factors that fall in the three dimensions that make up the opportunity index. So feel free to go on there and check that information out, and it will uh, pull up something that looks similar to um, the scores that LaShawn showed um, in his slideshow. So definitely um, take a look at that, and feel free to tweet that information out if you find some information that's compelling about your county score or your state score using the hashtag opindex. This is Monique. I just want to add to that that um, we, so the data um, right now is at state and county, so if you pull your zip code data, it, it will be the information within your county. It won't just be for your zip code, but we are excited to be working on the metro level index next year that will look at metropolitan areas. We're going to be working with Measure of America on that as well. Um, so just to clarify that, if you pull your zip code information, it will be for the county that that zip code resides in. Thanks, Moni. On for, to our next question, are there any specific words of caution you would use in terms of interpreting these data? Um, I'll uh, take so that I and then I'll also... That. Nope, sorry. Go ahead. I can... I can Rebecca. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So there's a, there's a <laughs> um, lot I thought... of caution, I think, with, um, with using the opportunity index. Um, it is an index, so it's a composite of a lot of different data. So each source has its own caveats. I encourage everyone to look at the methodology if you have questions about the data. So on the Opportunity Index website, there should be a link to the methodology. And there you can see um, a great amount of detail that Measure America put into describing each variable, the year that it's from, uh, the source, and any, um, <clears throat> any caveats about the data that we found. Um, I think one important factor to understand is that the data is, on average, um, a two-year lag from the day it is published. So 2016 data will have, um, a lot of its data will be from the 2014 census. Um, so understand that things like um, poverty, uh, I think we saw some increases, uh, some decreases in poverty nationally in the news, but um, that was for 2015 data. We're using 2014 data. So um, there's about a two-year lag, and each variable is a little different, so to understand that. Um, and then finally, there are, there are challenges with calculating data at the county level. Um, so there will be some several counties that might be too small to have a score or um, will have missing data, and that is because um, sometimes counties just don't have enough population to publish those results. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, something else that I would also add is just that, um, you know, the index is a great tool and um, it gives lots of numerical data, but something that's also really important to the context of not just the index, but any source of numerical data is uh, qualitative data or stories from, from people that really highlight and add context to the numbers being seen. So um, absolutely everything um, that Rebecca says are um, great cautions that should be looked at um, in regards to the analysis of the data. Um, but I would also add to that that, um, you know, there have to be 
human stories that uh, attach to and add context to the numbers that you're seeing in the data. So we absolutely try to connect with local community members and politicians and um, policymakers to really highlight and show us uh, kind of what is the story behind some of the changes that we're seeing in the data. Uh, we'll go on to, I believe we have uh, one more question. This is the last question. Are you pushing this data proactively to individual state and county officials and providing them with resources for how to improve? Uh, I'll take that question. I think that that's, some, that's something that we're absolutely looking to do. I think uh, LaShawn is a good example of us um, aiming to put data into the hands of uh, grassroots and national um, persons working in the space of things that Opportunity Nation and many other organizations are passionate about. Um, with our aligned policy agenda, we're absolutely looking to make sure that our coalition members and our opportunity leaders have access to our index data so that they're able to use that in their day-to-day -day work. And we're also uh, identifying other ways to put this data in the hands of uh, local and community officials to uh, allow them to empower their residents in regards to what's going on in their communities. So it's definitely something that's um, an ongoing uh, process of us uh, learning how to continue to do that and do that well. Um, but with our index and action stories, we look to really update people on how the index is being used in local organizations. And we, look, we also look to continue to highlight um, our opportunity leaders and coalition members who are using the index uh, data in their work that they do every day to empower the populations that they work with. This is Monique. I would just add that um, we we like to do a lot of listening too. So we make it, you know, the data available online and people can pull up their information really quickly by their state or their county um, and compare across the country. I think that's another unique factor about the index is the national um, comparability. Um, but we like to hear what people are doing. Um, they know their communities best. Um, some of our friends in Iowa, uh, Rob Denson, the head of the Des Moines Area Community College, is a, is a good example of a community that's really embraced it and used it as a dashboard for their own progress. Um, so we'd love to hear more of those stories, and that's, uh, and that's what our coalition helps us with as well, is how have you used the index? Um, and, you know, what are you doing to impact change? Um, and that's something we want to grow in for sure in the coming years. Thanks, Monique. Um, so we are um, done with all of our questions, but I will turn things over to first LaShawn and Rebecca as our guest speakers to see if they have any closing remarks that they would like to say uh, to our attendees. No, I just want to thank everyone for joining and, and being allies in this movement. Okay, thank you, LaShawn. Rebecca? I just wanted to thank everyone for, for, for listening and for, um, for using the index in the community. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, well, we would definitely like to thank everyone for joining us in today's webinar, and we really hope that you all see this data as an opportunity for us to dialogue, grow, and collaborate about important, important issues that are facing our nation. If you have any questions, feel free to email either myself, LaShawn, or Rebecca at the email addresses uh, listed in our slides. Um, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.